Yeah, this time, you know, as, as scheduled product governance, my, one of my very favorite topics uh, under MIFID II, uh, as you may have already got a certain glance about yesterday, and I had a very interesting discussion with uh, people from, from Denmark uh, last night on kind of their approach, and uh, I asked them, of course, for, for their particular patients if things, you know, are just what, what we discussed already, but for, for anyone and just for the purposes of going through, through my slides. Um, my idea is to give you a more general view of, you know, what is product governance really about rather than getting lost into certain details. So I have some details more at the end, uh, just in terms of, you know, what can be ideas to, to, to get this concept uh, workable and uh, done in practice. Talking about product governance, just one general remark in the begin very beginning. Um, this is not just, you may be aware of this, but just for the avoidance of thought, I would like to, to um, point out that that is not just limited to a MIFID II exercise. You know, there are certain papers, there have been certain papers, not everyone has taken notice thereof, from YOSCO, the International Securities Regulator of late uh, 2013 on retail structured products, including product governance uh, rules. They are just in, in, in the way they can do proposing generally. Then we have seen a paper from the ESAS, the three European supervisory authorities um, in, also in 2013 on principles for product oversight and governance without restriction to any specific service or product. And some of them call it POG. So if, you, if someone talks about, in particular from IOPA, about POG or POG, they mean product oversight and governance, which, which should be, from my point of view and perspective, the same as we just talk about product governance, just in terms of what we are talking about and which terms are being used. And then most recent or more recently, there has been a paper from the EBA, the European Banking Authority, and another thing from IOPA, as I mentioned before, for product oversight and governance principles for products other than um, ins financial instruments we're talking about here. This relates to payment products, to account products, to loan and credit products, and of course to insurance products. So watch this space. I would just say uh, product governance is a, is a principle that is being rolled out uh, in any kind of respect towards any kind of product or service in the financial service industry in Europe, as I understand. Um, I just give you a brief introduction uh, again, I mean, in addition to what I just said, other than regarding MIFID II, uh, then briefly, and you, you may just um, find one or two slides from, from yesterday, which was just by, by accident, as I at short notice needed to, to extemporize a bit. Uh, then what is generally the idea of product governance rules because I think many people they just read the text and struggle to understand what what does it mean what is it is it about and you know we are underway with a number of of clients in the industry in Germany and elsewhere uh, and just understand or try to understand what what is really the crucial point and possibly this is also helpful then for for you and your relevant jurisdiction um, and at the end uh, what is the, the main of most favorite topic for many people these days, but I always say this is just one piece of the entire product governance um, principle or, or rules uh, rule book, uh, the target market um, assessment. So, you know, this, as trivial as it is, uh, once more, um, here, you know, just important that, and I'm coming to this in a moment later, uh, we talk about responsibilities not only of the distributor, as it is the normal way of MIFID addressing things, but also of, on the left-hand side, the product manufacturer. This is what you already, of course, know about uh, MIFID too. And this picture you already know, but just once again, I would like to say, I mean, this was prepared for this presentation and just, you know, I used it for the other one yesterday. Um, irrespective of the aspect of the inducements we talked about yesterday, or about information obligations and so on, again, you see, the, the aspect that the product is manufactured in a certain way uh, has a kind of um, yeah, principle uh, relevance and is, it is just the first step in terms of, and as it is called, I think, in the agenda, the product uh, life cycle. I call it the product and sales life cycle. I come to this also in a, in a moment. Uh, in addition to, to that slide, uh, you know, this is Markus Ferber, the rapporteur for MIFI II in the, uh, in the European Parliament. Um, I quoted him from a press release um, uh, some time ago when he said, you know, products should in the future uh, be uh, more aimed at satisfying the needs of the investors and not the distributors. You, of course, understand the connection with this slide, but you can also take it as a blueprint, so to say, for why are there product governance rules. And if we then look back a bit, 
just the second piece of my kind of more general remark on, on product governance rules uh, at, this, at this stage. Um, you may have, I mean, where, does it, where did it come from in terms of, of MIFIA II and MIFIA? Um, you may remember there has been a consultation paper from the EU Commission in late 2010. This was the first step, I think it was called something with the, with the MIFID review, you know. Uh, and this was, of course, the kind of the first step um, towards getting the MIFID II proposal out by the Commission uh, in October 2011. And while in the first proposal by the Commission in October 2011 we did not find any specific rules on product governance, just to, to remember, in the Commission's um, consultation paper of 2010, a year ago, there were certain um, aspects mentioned about product governance already, interestingly. So then they dropped it, but then afterwards the European Parliament um, stepped in with Markus Ferber, Sven Giegold and others. Uh, I was somehow uh, close to, to those discussions those days, so would like tr to try to give you a clue in a little bit at what I just, just noticed there. Where did it come from and what did it mean and what do we now find in the papers? And if we see a difference between what it should mean, this is more what I'm talking about, and what is really in the papers, uh, we just try to build, um, gap that bridge in terms of understanding better, so having a better idea how one can deal with it in the, in the local jurisdiction one is working at. So then it came in, as I said, in, I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it was around the time, uh, September 2012, when the Parliament was voting on it, and since then, um, product governance rules were part of, of the MIFID II body. And of course, last year when we saw it being released in the EU Gazette, um, then we saw certain rules. What did we see? I mean, we just noticed in Article 16, just a little bit of attention to detail now, in Article 16, I think it's paragraph three with a number of subparagraphs, it's the organizational basic rule. You know, we have the investor protection rules, Article 24 and following, and we have the basic organizational obligations rule where you also find the telephone recording obligation and so on. Um, and there it has, say, five or four paragraphs, rather small uh, and rather thin in terms of uh, content. What should be the general obligations from an organizational perspective, just from the perspective of the legislator, um, what the manufacturer uh, or a distributor of a financial product needs to do in terms of product governance. And you find another paragraph, I think it's Article 24, paragraph 2, also not so much about what it should mean in connection with those investor protection rules. And then, if you look into ESMA's papers, you know, what have they proposed? Um, first in the discussion paper, um, May last year, then uh, in the uh, technical advice, consultation paper, and then in the technical advice, December last year, and what, what we are all now waiting about uh, to come from the EU Commission, uh, the delegated acts we expect for, as, as we discussed yesterday, possibly and hopefully beginning or so of December. ESMA has proposed not only four paragraphs, they proposed, is it five, six, seven, eight, ten pages? And if you have seen the uh, ESMA opinion on retail product governance rules for retail structured products or the like of March 2014, I think it was 27 March 2014, this is about 20 pages of paper, so you can already could have a, a clue about what will come on level two. So we see a very kind of a thin basis, so to say, in terms of text of language in the level one, and then we see a very elaborate, a very broad way of ESMA kind of bringing these things uh, into life and making it detailed and hopefully workable. And as I may have mentioned yesterday, the German legislator just last Friday issued um, a first draft bill of the implementation for MIFID II rules in Germany, uh, and they had already uh, a try earlier this summer uh, in, in a specific act which was introduced, the Small Investor Protection Act, where, where the German legislator um, uh, in, in advance, but as of beginning of 2017, introduced product governance rules into the German Securities Trading Act. However, the German legislator only picked up those four or five paragraphs I mentioned before from the level one text. So German industry was and is a bit kind of struggling about looking at level one, which is just a little bit, looking at level two, which is pages, what do I need to comply with and what do I need to, to look at? And we always tell, and I always tell the clients, look, I mean, ESMA has not released those papers just for the purpose of uh, getting this back and just you know, showing you things and making you aware and making you worry. And then they say, okay, look at level one. 
you know, look into those details of level two, they will become relevant you know, one or the other way, and we will see it, as I understand, in a few weeks' time. I think what is quite important in understanding what product governance should be about, and I tried to talk about UK issues, so apologies um, to, to those who may know better, but I've tried to uh, get well informed from my UK colleagues, um, including those who have worked in the Investment Management Association and other places. I understand that when the European Parliament introduced and included product governance rules in the MIFID II draft text, those days what I mentioned before, they were also inspired by what has already been set up by the FSA with uh, treating customers fairly approaches about 10 years ago, certain principles, and then lately what is now the FCA, a part of the former FSA, I mentioned yesterday already, their approach to conduct regulation in a very rather strict sense. My colleagues always say that's a very bullish regulator, I mentioned it yesterday, I think. Um, and this is just a slide uh, which was presented by um, Chris Woolard, one of the directors, as I understand, from the FCA, uh, and at another occasion in, in July and summer 2013. And I organized the slide and talked to those people and said, look what it's about. And if you look at my latest sli slide, I didn't present yesterday. This looks quite similar, but believe me or not, it was just by accident looking similar because I had a similar idea to, to show it on a slide. But just what that you see here, Product governance, a very important piece, and we see it, of course, and this is what will come next afterwards, product intervention, what somehow, you know, needs together, and we will see what we hear about it later. Uh, my understanding is, and this conforms possibly with what we, you see here, product governance is, you know, the way you internally and generally should deal with it, and if that is not sufficient for some reasons, there may be product intervention, but this should be more threat than reality, possibly. And again, you see the difference, and I'm coming to this in a moment, between the point of sale rules and the product governance rules. That's a very important distinction, in particular for getting it implemented uh, and, and running. And as, as you read here, firm, firms should place the customer at the heart of product design and governance. Um, for some players, this may have been practiced before. For others, it may have been like, I have a smart product, I have a smart marketing, I have smart papers uh, to show this product, I have a smart distribution, uh, system, but this is not really linked to each other, so this is the try to get things more closely aligned. Um, this is just in, a, in addition to what I showed in the beginning. What you could or should um, have in mind when looking at these things is that as MIFID, as you see it on the right hand side, I hope you, you can see the colors properly, um, was generally a you know, distribution focused um, regulation, of course, not, not focused on the client, but the behavior, the conduct towards the client. Uh, now MIFID II is in a way kind of e extending its reach to the manufacturer. At the same time, we have specific rules, and therefore don't, please don't misunderstand the slide, in particular as you are more or less all lawyers, as I understand. Um, USITS and AFMD is of course the product and the asset manager regulation, and for technical reasons you're aware of, this. MIFID II does not apply to those asset managers generally, other than they are providing investment services in addition. I'm aware of this. Just wanted to show you in practice, and you're aware of that possibly already, in practice, any person who is manufacturing products to get it on the market with a distributor who is governed by MIFID II will need to be aware of those rules, and we come to it also in a moment in terms of information exchange and so on. Just to show you things are getting more closely together and even more need to get things sorted out properly um, uh, in a way. So the next two slides, um, the, this is what I mean. Somehow it looks a bit similar possibly to what the FCA has, has set out. These are two slides. This one is colored and this one is only uh, partially colored. This is my main message about, and it's a little bit similar to what Jean-Philippe has provided possibly yesterday. My main message about what is the current situation under, under MIFID I. And uh, I don't know, I, I think I didn't mention it yesterday when I, when I was standing here, that you know, ESMA's observation is that you know, level two uh, provides for rules like this, sorry, MIFID I provides for rules like this, uh, and the practice under MIFID I uh, is, is uh, significantly lower, lower. And now MIFID II even enhances this level or just keeps it the way, like for the inducement uh, core rule, but we want to align practice or get it closer to what should be uh, read in the text as such. For product governance, of course, we have entirely new rules under MIFID, and this is, you know, if, if I call this the product and sales life cycle, starting with the manufacturer, which is, you know, very often a separate legal entity from the distributor, sometimes these are different 
kind of uh, areas within the same organization. Um, and you distinguish and you see, you know, what is MIFID I really about and what, what is the practice under MIFID I about? What is the regulator really supervising? What are my colleagues auditing on? Uh, what is just the letter of the law in terms of how it is being interpreted by regulators since 2007, um, beginning of uh, 2007, uh, when, when MIFID I uh, came into force, beginning of November. And as you see here, a very um, specific focus on point-of-sale rules. You've got rules on inducements, on suitability, appropriateness. We discussed it uh, more or less all over the, the past uh, one, two days here. Uh, information, transparency, uh, documentation, recording, all these things. Some other things in a post-sales scenario are, are also governed and, you know, some things in advance. Conflicts of interest, I think, is a very important point. I think we didn't have a session specifically on this. Um, I understand that ESMA is very keen on enforcing conflict of interest rules and everything we are talking about generally are specific ways of dealing with conflicts of interest, but the general rule, in a way, you need not only to look at a conflict of interest, disclose it to the client, you need to manage it and get rid of it as far as possible. And this is something which I understand is new in addition to all these specific rules. So this is the, the MIFID I status uh, and the lesson learned um, from the, the UK experience, from the FCA's approach, from discussions on European level. The idea was then to extend uh, MIFID II to the entire product and sales lifecycle which in particular means, I don't know how good you can see it, the, the lower box here, what I say, this is the core of product governance rules, <laughs> which relate to the manufacturer and relate to what is the first stage of the distribution um, cycle, so to say, before product arrives at the point of sale. Um, in addition, of course, product intervention, I just kept a few other things, uh, and inducements, this, this just goes through in terms of disclosure, um, having an organization, a list on inducements, and then can, can I be paid or accept inducements or not? But here we talk about product governance. But uh, what is very important, I think, and I have another slide in a moment, yes, uh, that we understand, hopefully, that product governance is something that is about the first stage of the life cycle and then the second one, but it is clearly not intended from my uh, firm uh, conviction to in any way extend to what is the sales organization possibly but not not generally not at all to the point of sale and this is one concern I've heard quite a lot and this is I think you know in terms of getting it more detailed from the general possibly good idea that you go to the so to say potential root causes of things that you don't only start to govern things when you know the advisor sits together with the client and everything has been happened before so Nothing could be anticipated. I think that's the core idea behind it. But to get in, getting, getting it done in practice, getting it to details which are workable, and, 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 I think that's a major exercise. And to date, I, I don't have any kind of specific or easy solution about it. Just want to try to make you aware of, you know, what is the general idea, where does it come from, and what are the challenges we still all have in terms of getting it specified in a way that is workable in each, each European country. And ESMA will need... Um, certain input, of course, further input. There may be level three measures in the future, including on product governance. I don't know if Matteo has mentioned this specifically yesterday, um, but they need some input feedback from you, from the industry, um, because this is a very difficult uh, and new exercise to, to get it done in a way that it's not only cumbersome, that it's not only additional rules, that we not only say, oh, pfft, what is it for, so that it helps, anticipating from the beginning to get a product suitably and appropriately to the proper client. I also come to this in a moment. And there are a lot of details on product governance rules. I'll just pick up a few later, but just want to give you more the, the broader picture idea. Uh, hopefully that works. And if you, yeah, and I have some details on, on product governance just to, to, for you to remind, and then you can deeper dive in uh, the, the level two texts to read. I think this is all set out there uh, by ESMA. I try to summarize it, it somehow. But just please keep this in mind when I later come to the point, how can I get an idea, for example, of what a target market assessment uh, can be? 
I understand, and I'm very sure that ESMA has the same understanding, and it's just a question, you know, can they bring it into practice in a proper way now? These are the two fields which need to be governed, and this is a very separate area at the point of sale. Of course, first of all, I mean, you know, they need a process, a product governance process. I think ESMA speaks about product governance arrangements. I mean, generally, in Germany at least, and I think in many other countries, that's a new thing. You have dealt with, of course, product setup. You have dealt with product pre-selection for sales. But to have a dedicated process is possibly uh, a bit new um, somehow. And this implies a number of issues uh, you will be aware of uh, already. Um, cost structure, of course, we talked about costs a lot yesterday. You know, costs are a very favorite topic of ESMA, as I understand, because cost is interesting uh, as an aspect of inducements, as an aspect as such being, being disclosed, as an aspect under product governance. Everywhere, cost is an issue. You have no interest in the market. You only have cost, so that's even more important these days. And as I said already, those requirements are different, and in addition, I think that's what Jean-Philippe also showed us yesterday, to what is uh, relevant in terms of suitability and appropriateness test in particular. Another thing is that during the, the product life cycle, I think, did you mention yesterday, Jean-Philippe, about the pharmaceutical industry? Um, I mean, this was an idea I heard from Markus Ferber also from, from time to time. I mean, Germans tend to um, compare everything with cars. I always say, I mean, comparing financial products with German or other cars anyway um, is not really the best approach, possibly. And I'm also not entirely convinced if those kind of pharmaceutical products are really comparable. But anyway, we have those uh, um, principles there that in particular, if a product proves, and the same applies for cars, by the way, as we have just recently again learned, including for German cars, that you may call things back and you need to monitor and you need to uh, then adopt certain kind of new procedures and so on. So there may be certain appropriate actions to be taken. What it means, we will see. Of course, we have issues like you have 1,000 customers who have the product already uh, in their custody account and then the regulator says, no, no, don't sell it to the other 500. What about the 1,000 thousand ones who have, already, have, have it already? It's similar to those mis-selling incidents, I understand, in the UK. Um, where you have these kind of remediation exercises. We, we do, all don't know what it's about, um, and I understand uh, this will be a, an issue possibly more of theory than of, of practice. Um, very important just to very intensively communicate possibly with each other. Manufacturers, of course, are obliged to provide information to the distributors that they can just um, comply with their set of rules, and as we understand, the rules apply to the manufacturer. They have their set of rules as set out by ESMA, and the distributor has its set of rules more or less mirroring the one, and we will see in practice how you know, the one and the other can just get it workable again and done from their point of view. And what I find very important, I did mention it before, and you see it from this slide, and I'm coming back quickly. Um, when you talk about anticipating suitability or appropriateness at the point of sale, I think it's very clear, but people are really discussing this in Germany uh, at this stage, that the distributor with its product governance obligations is clearly closer to that client because it's one's own client than the manufacturer can ever be. Uh, and I've just received uh, and asked my, my UK colleagues for some information about how the FCA has dealt with it, and I understand this is very in line with their approach in terms of um, the manufacturer can't really even know about de details about the end client. They can just have a more general idea. So the more specific, the more granular work may need to be done by the distributor in terms of product governance rules. However, in the industry, we see, a, see the tendency that one would like to have the manufacturer um, more dealing with it in a way, have a standardized, as simple as possible approach for the manufacturers. And then the distributor says, ah, look, everything has been done. That's fine. I don't need to do it so much on my own. Maybe an approach in terms of saving cost and getting it, it, it workable in terms of standardization, what I entirely appreciate. But I'm not sure if this is in the, in the sense, really, of what product governance is for. Otherwise, this may be just an exercise of, of words where you have a target market. No one can, can really ever I have an idea about what this is helpful for. But we will see how, how this works in practice. I think we need to have a, uh, find the right middle between standardization and you know, how can I really help uh, that end clients 
get the products possibly a bit better, but more suitable than, than before. So then finally, I'm looking, I'm just, the last two, three minutes, uh, I understand I'm more or less in time, hopefully. Um, just an idea about target market assessment, and that's not a solution. And as I said, we are working with clients these days on these things, so I just did not try to present you an idea of how this can look, because otherwise someone would possibly understand I'm just, you know, disclosing things from clients to you here. Uh, happy to discuss anyway, but here I try to make it a bit more generic and uh, I hope for your understanding. Um, what is important if we look at, I mean, I understand the target market assessment is just the first step in terms of getting product governance rules right. You know, it's not the only exercise you have because you have your stress testing, conflict of interest checks, uh, cost checks, is the product designed in a way it can be understood, blah, blah, blah. Of course, this all needs to be in a way linked to the target market, but getting the target market in a way identified is, as I would understand, a first and very important step, but that's not the entire exercise you need to perform. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, there are uh, certain sources uh, on, on level one, and then you have level two uh, and level three about to come. I understand ESMA may consider to have some more detailed guidance, but uh, I, we discussed it last week, and, but I said, look, uh, as soon as the quite detailed guidance on, <coughs> sorry, level two is not really alive, uh, it doesn't really make sense to consider level three because to make it even more detailed as long as people like in Germany still look on what is level one and in German language in the German text these days, people need to become aware that level two is really meant as being applied and then we can see if we need some, some more detail. And on the other hand, and this is just a practical approach of course of the, of the clients at least in Germany, we need to implement in particular the no, new PREPS rules for this um, key investor uh, a key information document, the, the PREPS kit for those uh, products which fall under PREPS, um, package retail and investment products, and PREPS, I come to it in a moment, contains certain issues about what may be a target market uh, assessment, so people try to bring this together, at least in Germany, just from the practical perspective, but of course the MIFID II legislator did not really intend to, to have the PREPS ideas uh, included, but hopefully it's, it's the same and hopefully it it gets done. And USITS, I mean, has a more general approach about, you know, as we have it already today in the prospectus, uh, this is a product which is relevant for retail investors, full stop, uh, something like that. Um, and I try to just come again from what is the purpose of all that, you know, not in terms of what do I read in paragraph A, B, and C, in terms of what should it end up at the point of sale. And if I just distinguish between advice sales, non-advice sales, and execution only, where you have the suitability test, the appropriateness test, and then uh, none of both. Um, that's the question, Hyde. How can you get from a product governance perspective on the beginning, at the beginning of the product life cycle, to the end? And how can you anticipate it properly, what you need to do at the end of the day? And I think it should be the most logical way to, to getting it started, just to look at what is required at the end to see what may be required in the beginning in a more abstract, more typical way. And if we look just briefly at the suitability test, I mean, these are the things you know, you're aware of. This is the MIFID II way of the suitability test. The client issues, you know, knowledge, experience, um, ability to bear losses, which is uh, a new aspect which is explicitly mentioned, the risk tolerance. And then, of course, you need to recommend a suitable, individually relevant product for the client. And I just want to highlight, if this is what you need to do at the end of the day, if you are advising clients at the point of sale, then you would need a manufacturer which envisages this somehow, and you would need a product pre-selection which anticipates this also somehow. And the same applies for, for the appropriateness test, of course. I mean, as simple as it is, but I think that's quite important. And many people just look at what we understand at, at certain language in the text and then they get lost with what is really meant with it. You know, similarly, of course, the, the lower level here of, of what, is, what one is ob obliged to, a little bit of the client uh, knowledge experience, and you know, the distributor should know from its individual client what, where they stand. Of course, the manufacturer normally cannot. And then you have this appropriateness test you're aware of. And in, in terms of execution only, I mean, for example, if you engaged in execution only business at the point of sale, in Germany, these are not so many uh, players who do this, including, it was, I think, Bernd Geier mentioned yesterday, discount brokers and others, they very often still apply the appropriateness test for some reasons. But I would understand 
as simple as it is, if you go for execution only business, there are certain criteria and provisos which you need to fulfill just to be able to do execution only for your client. Um, and I listed those here. Of course, then the manufacturer, if they are such a distributor, needs to anticipate also that in terms of non complex products in particular. As simple as it is, but I think this is just a few pieces of um, certain, certain, so to say, stones to build a road with it. And then, just briefly, and then I'm coming to the end, um, thanks for your patience. What Preeps says, um, Preeps refers to a, I, I just put the, the language from the text as it is, uh, type of retail investor to whom it, it is intended to be marketed, and then again we see the ability to, to bear losses, and it mentions the investment horizon, which is a term which I understand is not used one-to-one -one in MIFID two, but hopefully it is already included <laughs> in the client um, client's uh, uh, needs and so on, which need to be assessed under, under MIFID. And then we have this risk-reward profile. And again, watch this space. The summary risk indicator, I think, will be a very important and interesting aspect of it. Um, and then my private um, view about, for example, the, the use hits kit is that if I get this kit and there's one to seven uh, risk matrix and they say it is four, five, six, or, or two, and I read the other text of, of that use its kit, I always, or normally, if there are not, not so many people in the room, tend to say, you know, if I get the a use its kit for my personal investment, it doesn't help me anything. I don't understand in anything about it. I don't understand what, this, what kind of product this is, what this risk matrix means. So I think we will need to be aware of that, and as the, the regulator and the legislator intends to make people really aware of what's in um, and what it's all about, that these exercises like you have an indicator and this labels something and then I provide it to the client and the client signs anything but has understood nothing, I think the, the, the new approach is a bit, bit more enhanced. If it is really as enhanced under preps, we will see. And finally, and this is just in a nutshell what I cannot show you here in more detail, but it is very close and very down to earth to what we have seen before. Of course, any target market assessment of course, starts possibly with a client category like, you know, retail, professional clients, eligible counterparties, as, as simple as it is. Then, of course, the financial instrument, and I've seen a, a similar thing from the, the FCA or guidance where it says, or from my colleagues, you, you can have a product risk approach and you can have a client approach, so to say. And again, as trivial as this is, this is in a very nutshell are certain things you, you need to be aware of and take into account when working on a target market assessment uh, and happy to discuss more details uh, bilaterally. Yes, that, that's it for the moment. That's it from me. Thanks very much for your patience.